got no ice on those. Uh, a lot of rain coming back, but here we are. Great job. And, uh, we're going to pick up uh, where we left off almost last time. We were talking about this fact. Is it evolution or is it creation? Is it the words of God or the words of man? What, what do we really believe, even as Christians? Because, uh, as I said last week, I was an agnostic, said Buddhist evolutionist, came to faith in Jesus when I was 27, became a theistic evolutionist at that point. So then I had God and the Bible and evolution. And then ultimately, I became a biblical creationist. Young Earth, global flood, normal days in Genesis, all those kinds of things. And so uh, we're going to get to some of those kinds of things, I think, next week, if I recall. But we're going to... Uh, now, here, here was the big question. Uh, who do we believe? God or people? Do you want to refer to the words of God or the words and opinions of people? So that's kind of the overriding thought as we're going through this. And uh, our ideas have consequences. There's no, no doubt about it. The ideas of evolution have certain consequences. We're seeing that in our culture. The ideas of creation have certain consequences. And our assumptions determine our conclusions. What you assume about things is going to determine the conclusions you come to about things. I'll give you one quick story. I was in dental practice uh, down at Clear Lake City at the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston from 1968 to 71. And my patients were the engineers for NASA and uh, a lot of the families of the astronauts, they had their own dentist. And some of the geologists that dated the moon rocks, okay? So when they first dated the moon rocks, they said the range of dates went from about four to four and a half billion years. Then about a year or so later, they came out with a new range. And they said, oh, the range actually went on the age of the moon rocks from about three to four and a half billion years. And I'm, whoa, that's one big range. So I called up one of my patients that was one of the geologists that dated the moon rocks, and I said, hey, uh, was the range on the dates on the moon rocks any, any different than what you published? Well, yeah, he said, uh, we got dates from around 6,000 to around 28 billion. I said, well, why didn't NASA publish the whole range? Oh, he said, we didn't want to confuse the people. Everybody knows that uh, 6,000 years isn't going to do it. His assumptions determine his conclusions, OK? And we couldn't publish 28 billion. That would mean the moon was here before the Big Bang went kaboom. So we just published the range of dates that we knew before we ever got there, it's about that old. Assumptions determine conclusions. So they published what they thought before they ever got a single rock. Okay, that's, that's an assumption, and that's what they published. All right, so now let's see. I'm going to jump here. We're going to jump around a little bit here tonight. And uh, the creator God of the Bible, he tells us to study what he's made and we're going to see irrefutable evidence that he exists. No doubt about it. So we're going to look at Romans 1. Now this is where we ended up last week. First, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and I hope we're praying for the Jewish people, and also to the Greek, the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the just shall live by faith. And we mentioned everybody lives by faith. The wildest atheist has a faith-based worldview. We all believe by faith in something eternal. You either believe by faith in eternal God, or you believe by faith in eternal matter, or eternal energy, or something like that. Okay? So we all live by faith. Then he changes his tune. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and righteousness of men. Now, because they're ungodly and unrighteous, they do something. They hold the truth, or they hold back the truth, or they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. That's why you, you all said you'd not heard of the slow loris. 
I might have a picture to show you tonight, last time. Or the I-I, or the Weta, or there's all these different things that we're, we don't get a chance to hear about. Wonderful things our Lord has made so we can study it and give Him glory. We're not allowed to know because it breaks the rules of evolution. So they just don't tell us. They just don't put it in the books. All right, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them so they can know some things about God. For God has showed it unto them. How do you do it? For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. Okay, so we can see invisible things about God by studying His creation, even His eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. So we can even see things about the Godhead or the divine essence or the, what is God. And I think we talked about that, didn't we? What, God, what do we have? One God, three persons, right? One universe made up of three things, time, space, and matter. Did we talk about that last week? Okay. And then everything. You can look at it, and it's like, it's one thing, but it's three. We took it, I think, all the way down to music. Music, what is it? Melody, harmony, rhythm. Melody's not the same as rhythm. Rhythm's not the same as harmony. But it takes all three to make good music. All right. So they're without excuse. They study what God has made. It's evident. Even His triunity not perfectly in the creation, but it's evident in what we study. Because when they knew God, how? By studying the creation, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful. See, that's what God wants us to do. Study His creation, and then bring Him glory, and be thankful. Oh, Lord Jesus, th thank you. This is wonderful. Uh, well, what'd they do? They became vain in their imaginations. Now, that was me almost half my life. Big Bang evolution is a vain imagination. Even though I taught it at Baylor Dental College as a professor, okay? It's a vain imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and they changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like the corruptible man and the birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts and dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie. What truth have we had so far? We've had the gospel and the creation. Change the truth of God into a lie. Oh, you stupid Christians. You believe in that Jesus stuff? That's ridiculous. I mean, gods don't die, for instance. You say your Jesus died, okay? The gospel, the creation. Oh, my. You Christians, you're back in the Stone Ages. I mean, the evolution have proven the billions of years. It's, it's evident wherever we look. And so they change the truth of God into a lie. They worship and serve the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. So we're going to look at a Brazil nut just to kind of start tonight. And uh, the, you know what a Brazil nut looks like. And they're formed in like a cement pod. And it's, it's very tough. As a matter of fact, uh, the Brazil nut tree and the kapok tree are the two trees that hold up the canopy in the Amazon rainforest. So they're like 180 to 230 feet high. Not the tallest. We have the tallest trees in the world right here in USA. Giant redwood, giant sequoia. So, but they're big tall. Okay, so these pods with the seeds in it. By the way, what's the difference between a nut and a seed? A nut has two halves, like a pecan. You've got two halves. A peanut, you've got two halves. Whereas a seed only has one half. That's not right. It's one piece. <laughs> okay. And uh, so these are seeds. Anyway, so here it is. It's 180 feet up, let's say. It weighs about five pounds. It's about the size of a large coconut. If it lets loose up there, you don't want to be under the tree. It's unfortunate. And uh, so they drop out of the tree, but it is so tough it doesn't break open when it hits the jungle floor. Well, then how are the seeds going to get out? Well, God made a little animal called an agouti. And the agouti likes to eat Brazil nuts. So it will chew in there and chew through that tough outside, get in there, eat some nuts. It'll bury some. That's going to be the next generation of trees. And and uh, so we here in Texas have pecan orchards. And so some farmers in Brazil decided, well, hey, let's have some Brazil nut orchards. 
So they have the trees, and they grow the trees, and the trees bloom, has a beautiful yellow flower. No nuts. Why? What happened here? It had the flowers. Well, it took several more years for them to discover that the flower, the blossom, is sealed shut. It has like a lid on top of where the pollen is, and the pollen's down in a long spiral tube. So the wind cannot blow across it and pollinate it, like maybe an apple tree or a peach tree. Wind can blow across it and, and pollinate it, but it can't do that. It took them several years to discover there's only one insect that pollinates the Brazil nut tree flower, and that's the Brazil nut long tongue bee. And it has a very strong jaw and a very long tongue. So it'll go to the flower, take its strong jaw, open up, hold it open, hold the lid up, take the long tongue, stick it down in the spiral tube, get the pollen, and as it goes from flower to flower, it pollinates the tree. So they figured that out, they went out, they brought in the bees, and sure enough, they got nuts for one year. Next year, no nuts. Why? What happened? It took several more years for them to discover. In order for Mrs. B to invite Mr. B in the house so they can have baby bees, Mr. B has to go to one particular species of orchid, get the scent of that orchid on itself, I guess it's his cologne, and then Mrs. B invites him in. How would that evolve? You see, it all has to be there all at the same time, or it's dead. It's dead. They all, it's called obligatory mutualism. That's the big term. They're obliged, they're mutually obliged to each other to keep each other alive. So that's the uh, story of the Brazil nut. So that's something you can tell people about, because most people don't know that. How many of you knew that? Nobody. Where have you all been? <laughs> now, we live in Satan's world system. See, we have to dig to find these things. You can find them. And then some people will tell us things, too, now that we've done this so many years since actually 1971. All right. Job 12, what's it say? But now ask the beasts, and they shall teach thee. Boy, they really do. And the fowls of the air, they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, it shall teach thee. And the fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? Yes, you study what God has made, and you're face to face with the fact there has to be a God that did this. There's no way the impersonal plus time plus chance, goo to you by way of the zoo, as someone said, uh, there's no way, doesn't matter how many millions of years you have, it isn't going to happen. Because these things have to have all their parts from day one. You can't have a partially evolved Eyeball, it doesn't work, okay? They have to have fully formed eyeballs from day one, if there's something that has eyeballs. Um, anyway, so uh, the hummingbird, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the hummingbird. Wonderful little creature, okay, just wonderful little creature. Uh, weighs less than a dime when it's born, tiny, usually two eggs. And uh, you know what the mama hummingbird does? She'll make the nest, and then she'll check it to see how it's going to go in the wind, because it's a small nest, and it's fairly shallow, usually. And if she sees it's going to tip a certain direction in the wind, she'll go get some cobwebs, bring them back. If it's going to tip this way, she'll hang the cobwebs here as ballast. She'll go get little pebbles and put them in the cobweb. So it isn't going to do that. How does she know that? How would she know to do that? How does she know how to get cobwebs and not get all tangled up in them? You see, God put that information into all of his creatures. And we talked about the giraffe last week. Now, the mountain lion uh, mostly hunts at night, and uh, so it's dark. And they can jump off a 60-foot, 60 65-foot high cliff, and they want to, let's say there's some elk down here, and they're up there, 65 feet. They can jump up. They want to land right behind the elk, and then in one leap, they're up on the back of the elk. Of the elk. But now they've got a problem. Which way is the head? Because it's dark, okay? And what they want to do is they want to snap the neck. Well, I mean, if they go the wrong way, they're going to snap the tail. I mean, that isn't going to help. 
So God made them with sensory hairs in the middle of their paw. And when they grab a hold of the back of the elk, those sensory hairs say to the cougar, the hair on the back of the elk is going that way. And it instantly knows that means the head and the neck are this way. In an instant, as soon as it grabs a hold, it knows which way to go to snap the neck. Only God could do that. How would that evolve? Why would that evolve? You see, God had to do it. All right. Now, last week, I wanted to show you the crimson worm. So we're going to look at the crimson worm because it's getting close to celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And the crimson worm is very significant. So I'm going to share the crimson worm, and that'll give you something to share when you're talking to people. Uh, now, how did I get onto this? I was asked to do a devotional on Crucifixion Day, Good Friday, several years ago. And I thought, you know what? I think I'll just go to Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is known as the crucifixion psalm. Psalm 22, that's the one that says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All right? So, it's things in Psalm 22, Jesus is either saying out loud, or he's thinking, or he's talking to the Heavenly Father about, and in verse 6, it says this, 22 verse 6, Jesus said, but I am a worm. And I saw that, I thought, what? I mean, this is the Savior, the Creator, he says he's a worm? So I decided to look it up, which I had never done before. And that's not any common worm. The, the Hebrew word is tola or tolaoth. And it's, it, the normal word is rima for worm. But Jesus uses tola. Well, what's that? Well, that's a very specific worm. It's called the crimson worm or the scarlet worm. And now we're going to know why here in just a minute. So Jesus equates himself at his crucifixion. He's hanging on the cross with the, the crimson worm, the toloth. Okay? It's a small worm. There's the scientific name, coccyxillosis or kermesillosis. And uh, why, did he, why did he say, I am that particular worm? And there's the distribution. It's all over in Israel. They did special things with it. I'll share one or two. The mama worm, when she's ready to lay her eggs, she climbs up a tree or a fence post. And then she attaches herself to the tree. Jesus was attached to the tree. Inside the little shell she makes around herself, she lays her eggs, and she keeps them there till they're ready to hatch. Then they all hatch at the same time. And after hatching, the baby worms feed on the body of the mother for three days. Jesus said, this is my body. Take, eat. During those three days, the mother worm oozes a bright red crimson fluid. That's how she gets her name. This red fluid stains the tree, and the young worms are covered and permanently stained with it. When we know Jesus as our Savior, we're covered in his red blood permanently. After three days, the young worms are ready to leave the shell. The mother's still attached to the shell and to the tree, and she dies attached to the tree so that she can birth a family. What did Jesus do? He died attached to a tree to birth a family called his church. On day four, the mother worm's tail pulls up to her head into like a heart shape. It's no longer red. It turns into a snow-white waxy material. Well, that's interesting. The snow white wax looks like a little patch of wool stuck on the side of the tree. It begins to flake off and drop to the ground like snow. Isaiah 4, 1, 18. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson. There it is. The toilet worm. Though they be red like the crimson worm. That's the word. They shall be as wool. Fascinating. 2 Corinthians 5 says this, For he, God the Father, hath made him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us, who, talking about Jesus, knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And he had to be attached to a tree and die to do that and shed his red blood. All right, while the worms remains in the shell are still red and still attached to the tree, they're scraped off and used to this day to make what's called royal red dye. The white waxy material is used to make a high-quality shellac, used as a wood preservative. Jesus, Jesus is our preservative. 
The worm's remains are also used to make a medicine, aiding in the regulation of the human heartbeat. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the life. So the red dye, the crimson worm, the royal red dye, was used as the red to dye the high priest's robe red, and most probably in the covering of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Fascinating. The ram's skin was dyed red. So, Psalm 22, 6, Jesus says, He is that worm, the tola or tolaoth. Isaiah 1, 18, red, though your sins be red like crimson, they can be white. Isaiah 66, 24, the last verse in Isaiah, that shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me for their worm, there it is, the tola, shall not die. So if people don't believe in Jesus, if they haven't received their Messiah, the worm doesn't die. Well, if the worm didn't die, it couldn't birth its family. If we don't believe in Jesus, Jesus can't save our soul. It's the same thing as the worm not dying. And Jesus quotes that right there in um, Mark chapter 9, about verse 47, will say, And if thy eye offend thee, plug it out. It's better to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes be cast into hellfire, where the worm dieth not. Right out of Isaiah. Wow. So what if the toloth didn't die? Well, if the toloth, if the crimson worm didn't die, it couldn't give birth to its family. If a person rejects the Lord Jesus as his or her personal Savior in order to keep living according to the lust of the eyes and the lust of the flesh and the pride of life, 1 John 2, the tormenting worm will never die. The lake of fire is your destination. That's all there is to it. Jonah. Now this is interesting. Remember the gourd. The gourd comes up, and then God sends a worm to kill the gourd vine because Jonah, he wasn't loving the people of Nineveh. He wasn't even loving the cattle, okay? He was just loving himself and wanting his own comfort. So God sends this worm to kill the vine. It's the tola. Jesus is not only the Savior, he is also the righteous judge. And I thought that was kind of fascinating. Anyway, so the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior and the judge. The wages of sin is death. Jesus is the judge. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The same Jesus is the Savior. God commends His love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 5.8, Romans. So what do we need to do? Receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you have a new birth. A birth that is now possible because Jesus sacrificed his life willingly, attached by nails to Calvary's tree. Jesus died so you can live. The mother, Tolaoth worm, dies so that her babies can live. Jesus equated himself with that very crimson worm in Psalm 22. By the way, everybody's going to have one birth and two deaths, or two births and one death. You will have one birth, but you don't ever receive Jesus. That means you're going to have two deaths. You're going to have a physical death, and then what's called the second death, when you're cast into the lake of fire. Or you can have two births, your physical birth, and then you're born again when you receive Jesus, John chapter 3. Now you only have one death, your physical death. So everybody either has one birth and two deaths, or two births and one death. That's all of us. It's going to be one way or the other. All right, so the mother worm climbs on this tree to die, to birth her family. Jesus willingly went to the cross to die so that we can live eternally with him as his family. The baby worms are covered with the red fluid of the dying mother, just like we're covered with the red blood of Jesus and are washed as white as snow. Praise God for that. And almost all things are by law purged with blood. Without shedding of blood is no remission. Hebrews 9, 22. Ephesians 1, 6, and 7. The praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. All right, so Romans 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So at college campuses, I've had students come up Hey, I believe in Jesus, but I can't handle this resurrection stuff. Am I going to heaven? Nope. No, I believe in Jesus. And so does the devil. Okay? No. Resurrection. Without the resurrection, we're still in our sin. 1 Corinthians 15. All right, now I'm going to jump again. 
I'm going up here, right here. All right, Jeremiah. For as much as there's none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of the nations? For to thee doth it appertain, for as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble, and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. He hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom. He has stretched out the heavens by his discretion. So the testimony of the medicine cabinet. Quickly, this is a friend of mine, Tim Stout, and he, he writes these little booklets showing in physics and chemistry, evolution is impossible. Doesn't matter how much time you have, the physics and the chemistry can't do it, okay? So he goes on and he hands these out. He's been Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Berkeley, UT. He gets more trouble at UT than anywhere else, but anyway. So he's talking to an evolutionist. And he, said, and he says the question, how long did it take from the time from random chemicals started combining until the first cell was fully functional? Evolutionists believe that. Evolution, about 100 million years. Tim, have you ever noticed every medicine in your medicine cabinet has an expiration date? Evolutionists, yes. Tim, how far in the future does a typical expiration date extend? Evolutionists, about two to 10 years. Tim. Do not all packaged foods, herbs, medicines, etc., have expiration date, dates well under 10 years? I mean, you have a ham sandwich, you're going to let it sit there for 10 years and then go eat it? Evolution is certainly. Tim, biological compounds spontaneously decay. They rot extremely rapidly. Because of this decay, it's not safe to use them after a short period of time. Evolution, that is correct. Tim, if biological compounds have significant decay in less than 10 years, and e then even if a useful one did happen to accidentally form, how could it last for over a million years waiting for the first cell to form? Biological compounds decay, rot faster than random processes can form them. What's that mean? That means there's an obvious contradiction between the lengthy time spans assumed by the evolution model and the rapid decay or rot of every one of the medicines of all these things, any organic, anything, has a short shelf life. So the evolution of inorganic to organic to living cells from simple chemical compounds over millions of years is chemically impossible due to rapid decay. So the creator God of the Bible tells us, study what he's made, and we'll see irrefutable evidence that he exists. So we need to look at all this through our biblical worldview glasses, okay? If our worldview is based on God's word, and we look at something out there, we're going to interpret the evidence that we see based on our worldview. Oh yeah, the Bible's true. This universe is about 6,000 years old. We can't have millions of years. That's coming through your head. Whereas if man decides what is true, and evolution is true, and millions of years is true, then you look at, let's say, the very same fossil. And you're going to have a totally different interpretation of what it is because of your worldview, what you think back here. Your assumptions determine your conclusions. Russ Miller, Creation, Science, Evolution, Creation, Evolution, and Science Ministry, says this, Darwinism predicted that the fossil record would be filled with millions of transitional kinds. By the way, when I went to college back in the 50s, they were called missing links. And then I think it was Stephen Jay Gould about 40 years ago decided when we tell our students there are missing links, they're going to think they're missing. And then they aren't going to see this continuous chain of developing organisms from bacteria to humans because there's missing. So will change the name of the missing links to transitional forms. So now, missing links are called transitional forms. They're just as missing as they were, but they don't sound as missing when you call it a transitional form. Anyway, uh, he said you have, should have all these missing links revealing our evolutionary past. These would be reliable empirical criteria of Darwinism. Yeah, if they had them. 
For example, had a fish evolved into amphibians, that's what we're taught, we should find thousands of clearly identifiable transitional fossils going from amphibian to fish, a fish to amphibian, that show the change as a fin, you know, fish have these fins, gradually evolved into a shoulder, an elbow, ankle, toes, claws, I'm an amphibian's leg, and by the way, there's two sets because they're in mirror images of each other on both sides, so that's two different sets of genes to, to do that. If they all evolved from the same gene, then everybody would be totally right-handed, or they'd all have to walk sideways. I don't know what they would do, but they don't. Uh, but and also all the skeletal changes, and muscular, nerve, vascular requirements, huge, huge. How is that going to happen? The evolutionists say, give us enough time. Time isn't going to do it. All right, the slow loris. I said we'd show you a picture or two of the slow loris. So uh, there's a slow loris, okay. The only venomous primate. Venom glands, right here, okay. That's why most people never heard of it. Because it doesn't fit the evolutionary scheme of things for primates. Monkeys, apes, prosimians, they're the lemurs. We're not a primate. We're created above the primates to take dominion over the primates, okay. We're created in God's image. Oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth who has set thy glory above the heavens. Amen. He sure has. Now, the primary purpose of evolution is get rid of Jesus, get rid of the Bible, and then we can go eat, drink, and be merry. Okay? And that's the primary purpose. I'm going to show you a few quotes here in just a second. All right, I'll say this a different way. The battle of creation versus evolution is really a battle for the gospel. The main idea behind evolutionary theory is Get rid of Jesus. Get rid of Genesis. Get rid of the Bible. So they think once they get rid of Jesus and Genesis and the Bible, they can just eat, drink, and be merry. They're never going to stand before the righteous judge. They have no accountability. They don't want it. All right, so here is Richard Bozarth. He has passed away, but he was an atheist evolutionist. He said this, Christianity has fought, still fights, and will fight science to the desperate end over evolution. No, we Christians do not fight true science. Every major branch of science was first published by a Christian. Newton, Babbage, Pasteur, Lister, some of them even wrote commentaries on books of the Bible, okay? They were Christians, and God gave them the information for those areas of science. We don't fight true science. We fight science falsely so-called. Okay, so he goes on because evolution then, here's, he's going to give us the point here, evolution destroys utterly and finally the very reason Jesus' earthly life was supposedly made necessary. Get rid of Jesus. And, and then he says, destroy Adam and Eve and the original sin, that's Genesis, and in the rubble, you'll find the sorry remains of the Son of God. He refused to capitalize it, so I did. If Jesus was not the Redeemer that died for our sins, and this is what evolution means, then Christianity is nothing. He understood the issue. The average Christian doesn't understand the issue. All right, here's another one. This is Richard Lewinton from Harvard. He died last year. Atheist, Marxist, evolutionist professor at Harvard. He says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense. Whoa, what's he saying? They're studying science. And the science is telling them there's got to be a designer. There's got to be an engineer back there. It goes against common sense what they decide they're going to believe. It's the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science, and that should have quotation marks around it, and the supernatural. We take the side of science. It isn't true science. He's talking fake science. In spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. In spite of how crazy it is. He says, we still, we're going to stick with it. In spite of its failure to fulfill many of the extravagant promises of health and life. And in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. Because we have a prior commitment a commitment to materialism. Okay, so that's their commitment. Matter is all there is. There's no God. They've made that up front. Well, I'll read you a little more. 
It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world. In other words, there's nothing in science that says there is no God, matter is all there is. As a matter of fact, the more science we study, it looks like there's a designer. So what's he say? Explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we're forced by an a priori, that means an upfront adherence to material causes, to create an apparatus of investigation, a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how it goes against the very science they study, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Harvard professor. What's the issue? God. See, the issue has nothing to do with true science. The issue in the evolution, creation, origins, evolutionary scenarios, the issue is, is there a God? Well, I don't want to believe in God, so I'm going to make up something. All right, I'll read you another one. Uh, this is uh, Dr. George Wald. Now, look at this. He's an honest atheist. Here's what He passed away now, too. There are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. That means dead chemicals came to life and ultimately evolved into people. Spontaneous generation arising over the years to evolution. The other is supernatural creative act of God, and there is no third possibility. Okay, so everybody in this room is believing one or the other. Spontaneous generation that life arose from non-living matter was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. Well, that leaves us only one possible conclusion, that life arose as a creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe that which I know is scientifically impossible. Can you imagine someone saying that, okay? And he was very well respected in the evolutionary scientific communities. According to George Walt, matter is self-creating and self-organizing. Really? How does that work? He also said, said this, one has only to contemplate the magnitude of this task. Well, what's the task he's talking about? Nothing to chemicals, to life, to man over millions of years. So one has to only to contemplate the magnitude of this task to concede that the spontaneous generation of a living organism is impossible. Yet, here we are as a result, I believe, of spontaneous generation. Now, by the way, we bump into these kind of people that think this way on the college campuses. The college campuses are full of people that think this way. It's called living in fantasy land because you don't want to be responsible to a holy God. That's what it really boils down to. Now, here's Scott Todd, Kansas State, is it? Yeah. Even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, it does. Can you name anything out there that you would say, well, that just happened? I mean, these pews, you think there was a designer? They didn't just have a bunch of stuff and kind of shuffle it all up, Boop, out comes pews, right? Uh, everything has a designer. He said, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, and it does, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. What's he saying? He said, well, you see, I don't believe in God, so there can't be a designer, so it's all just happening by chance over millions of years. Basically, that's what he's saying. Now, here's a really old one. 1929, D.M.S. Watson. The theory of evolution itself is a theory universally accepted, not because it can be proved by logical, coherent evidence to be true, but because the only alternative is special creation, which is clearly incredible. Now, do you see a kind of a bias among these professors? Yeah, the bias is, I don't want to believe in God. So in spite of the science I study, which is telling me there's got to be a God, 
There's got to be a designer. Somebody had to do that. In spite of that, I'm not. That would be too incredible. I'm not going to do it. Unbelievable. So we have two faith-based worldviews. Creation teaches that by faith, the God of the Bible exists. He is the creator of all. Therefore, creationists believe by faith in eternal God. Evolution teaches that by faith, matter is self-creating and self-organizing out of nothing. Before the Big Bang, what? Therefore, evolutionists believe by faith in eternal matter. So we all, creationists and evolutionists, believe by faith in something eternal. Either eternal God or eternal matter, energy, something like that. So we study the same fossils, don't we? There's not evolutionary fossils and creationist fossils. We study the same fossils, but because of our worldview, we interpret the same fossil differently. We study the same living things. There's not evolutionary cows and created cows. They're all cows. But we look at it and say, God made cows. They look at it and they would say, oh, it took millions of years for those cows to form. Now some of them are saying the cows went back into the ocean and became whales. So I was at one university. There was, I said, I'll buy you a cow. I'll, either sh I'll even ship it down to the ocean. Let's watch it become a whale. I mean, what are they thinking about? Totally different breathing system, totally different metabolism, totally different everything. Except they do give milk to their babies. They nurse underwater, whales. Uh, that's on our Alaska number three with the humpback. We got a lot on whales. All right, God. By the way, some people, they just don't feel comfortable just picking something up off a table, okay? We want you to take what you need. If you don't feel comfortable do, doing that, what should they do? <laughs> Just take it anyway. Okay. All right. We want that information out there. But don't take it if you're not going to use it. I mean, we do have to pay for it somehow. But anyway, please help yourself to all that. Atheism. No God. Accidental, non-directed, random chance processes. Did it all. Okay. So your, your worldview then determines the conclusions you come to on these kinds of things. All true lab science, empirical science, observable science, supports the biblical account of instant creation. If it is true science, there's nothing about true science that goes against anything the Bible says about these things. Absolutely nothing. And there's been all kinds of things written about that in the last 40 years. So let's keep looking through our biblical reality glasses. Now, my dental students uh, asked me what the assumptions were behind evolution. I didn't know how to spot them. So I'm going to show you some of the ways you can spot the assumptions in the evolutionary literature. That's the things they don't know. Okay, you look for certain words. You're reading an article. You look for certain words like, we think. What do you mean, we think? You don't know? Then you look for a footnote. No footnote. Oh, so this is just in their head. They think it's like this. Uh, we posit, we believe, this suggests, this may mean there is consensus. So what if there is consensus? Can you have a whole lot of people that agree on something and they're totally wrong? We've been seeing a lot of that in our culture lately. Perhaps this, this may be, this is probably, well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. I want to know, is it or isn't it? We'll just give it enough time. We hear that all the time. Give it a, how is time going to help? You can't have time to, to give you fully functional organisms. They've got to be there to start with. Are the evolutionary assumptions valid then? Well, what do we see? We don't see ducky chicks. We see discrete entities, don't we? We don't see horsey cows. We don't see this. <laughs> uh, well, I happen to have a Texas horsey cow. Would you like to see it? Nobody wants to see it. We'll skip it. All right, there he is. See that? Or she? Uh, it's a Texas horsey cow. We can tell that. We don't see things like that out there, do we? Because God created each thing after its own kind. Now, could some sort of a geneticist move some genes around and come up with something like that? Maybe, maybe. But that's not how God did it. But... Proverbs 14, 12, there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's called deception. 
and the, one of the biggest deceivers that ever walked on planet Earth, Charles Darwin, okay? I mean, people love Charles Darwin because it gives them an excuse to not have to believe in God. That's the whole reason. The way that we take has eternal consequences, doesn't it? There is a way that we can take. It's total deception. And I was on that way almost half my life through evolution. It was a total deception. And then there's the way of truth. What does Jesus say? You know my truth. It's going to set you free. Where's that? John 8, 32, around in there. My truth. It'll set you free. Now, what's Satan's deception? If evolution is true, then Jesus is not the creator. Well, if Jesus is not the creator, then he doesn't have the authority and the right to be the savior. Because only the creator would have that right. Well, if Jesus is not the savior, then the Bible is not true. If the Bible is not true, let's eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Well, if tomorrow we die, then all we have is the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, which is of the world, 1 John 2. And that's where most of the world is right now, right there, 1 John 2, 16. So we're tempted by the world, the flesh, and the devil, Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. What activates our tendency to sin? Well, it's the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. That's usually where it starts. Evolution appeals to the flesh. It's easiest to go along with peer pressure and culture. We're proud. We don't want to appear to be stupid by believing in an instant creation and a 6,000-year-old universe, among other things. Oh, how ignorant could you be, okay? I used to just kind of cringe even thinking. And then I, I look back and think, how did I believe the other way? When you look at the science and you look at all these things God has made, there's no way it could be anything but God did it. And that's why he made it like he, and this is even subject to the fall and the curse. Okay, so we each have to decide deep down in our hearts who determines what is true. Does man determine truth or does the God of the Bible determine truth? Now I said that's going to be kind of our reoccurring thought as we go through. I want all of you to be thinking, who do I really believe? If man determines truth, we are presented with a system of origins that claims matter is self-creating and self-organizing and mindless, accidental, random, chance, non-directed, non-purposeful, non-intentional processes. There's no mind behind it. It's just happening. This mindless process evolved everything, inanimate and animate, including mankind and the universe itself. Now, which takes more faith, to believe what God has said or to believe this? In my opinion, it takes more faith to believe this. So we don't have cat birds <laughs> and we don't have doggles, although I wouldn't mind having one of those. Uh, you know, uh, somebody might be able to take the genetics and stick an eagle's head on a St. Bernard and come up. I don't think it would live very long, but we'll... I mean, they're doing things with genetics they shouldn't be doing. Matter of fact, they're changing the genome of the race of Adam. They're changing it. Reproductively reproducible. They're changing it. And it's not going to be the race of Adam when they get done with their tinkering with it. So when we talk about origins, we have to say a little bit about world views. And we do have time to do that. All right, so what then is a worldview? Well, that's your belief system, your basic belief system. Now, I thought I was going to get to dinosaurs tonight. It's going to be next time. I'm sorry. Your worldview is the position you take regarding the answers to the major questions in life, such as, does God exist? If he does exist, is he good? What can be known for sure? That's called epistemology. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? What do I value? What's important to me? Is there purpose and direction to life? See, your worldview answers those questions. The biblical Christian worldview answers every single one of those questions in a very positive and eternal way. So your worldview is like a big iceberg. Most of it is under the water and out of sight. So I'm using this pyramid to, to kind of pretend it's an iceberg. As you think in your heart, so are you. That's the root of your worldview. And the position you take in these areas, these 10 areas, forms your worldview. 
you're, you're, you have a position in theology and philosophy and ethics, and biology, psychology, law, sociology, politics, economics, history. Now, you might not be able to articulate it. I might say to you, uh, what is your position on um, ethics? And you might be, uh, uh, no, you have one. We all have one. Okay, now once you take a position in those areas, and that's what do we do in school. That's what we study. That's where we live, right there, in those areas. Well, once you take a position, out comes your value system. What's important to you? Uh, is loyalty important? Uh, how about godliness, respect for life? Are you pro-abortion? You see? What, what, what's coming out of your value system? What's coming out of what you really believe about things? Now, you don't see that part. That's the underwater part of the iceberg. What do you see? You see behavior. So your behavior is the outward display of what you really believe deep down in your heart. And you can have a different behavior on Sunday morning in church than you have on Saturday night. So which one is the real you? Is, which one are you pretending to be and which one is the real you, you see? We need to give that some thought. Who do I believe? All right, your art, your music, that comes out of it. Once you take a position in these areas, out comes your art. Like you think of those old guys who used to believe the Bible, a beautiful art. Then you have someone like Picasso. He was an atheist, okay? What, has an arm coming out of the side, and maybe an egg on the head, or who knows what. Your worldview determines how the pictures come out, how the music comes out. And then mathematics, all those have their own. So this is really everything we do right there. So what are some of the anti-biblical worldviews promoted by the God of this world on the campuses? Well, the big ones are the humanists, the Marxists, the New Agers, postmodernists, Islam. Those are the big ones. Now, uh, I was at a place called Summit Ministries for 16 years, and this is the chart we would use up there. Uh, notice, instead of saying a whole lot about it, notice evolution. If you're going to be a humanist, you're going to say, I don't believe in God. I'm an atheist. That means natural processes have to take care of everything. That means your ethics are going to be relativism. Well, it's all relative because there are no absolutes, okay? As long as I don't hurt anybody or something, you know. Well, then what's your biology? It's evolution. It's evolution because we had to throw God out. What's left? Evolution. You know what your economics is going to be then ultimately? Socialism. Because once you throw God out, there's no God. Now, who's in control? Man. What does man want when he's in control? Power. Okay? And so all of a sudden, you will have an elite group begin to legislate everything that the rest of everybody's allowed to do. It's an absolute result of throwing God out. And that's why all these pagan cultures are really socialist cultures. And uh, so we could say a lot about that. Anyway, we need to be straightened out. Do we believe God evolved things or do we believe God created things? Was it instant creation or was it millions of years? And you have to decide. Notice all the secular worldviews that are evangelistic source evolution as their worldview. By the way, why don't I have Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism? Because they're not the evangelistic ones on the campuses. I put up the evangelistic ones, the ones that are trying to get our kids, and they're doing a good job of it. So the source evolution is their worldview in the area of biology. The only way a secular worldview can survive is if there is no God of the Bible. Secular worldviews cannot function off of the responsibility that man was made in the image of God. It, it, they can't do it. Some people say, well, I can have evolution and the Bible. The two don't conflict with each other. Genesis and evolution, they fit beautifully with each other. Well, all right, we're going to think about that. Do the Bible and evolution fit beautifully with each other? All right, now remember, your ideas have consequences, and your assumptions determine your conclusions. So we're going to look through our biblical worldview glasses, and we're going to find out there is no middle road. All right, what's the Bible say? There is a God. What does evolution say? The basic premise is there is no God. So you can say, I can have both. Well, what's the Bible say? Earth was here first. 
What's evolution say? Oh no, stars were here first. The Bible says earth started all wet. Remember, it's all covered with water. Evolution said, oh no, it was dry. It all started dry. It was molten rock and then cooled down. What's God say? Light for the first three days, no sun until day four. Oh, oh my, no. Evolution says the sun had to be here to make the light. Could God make a stream of photons if he wanted to? I think he made those first three days with no sun, with a light source, because each day is half light and half dark, remember? I think he did that just to show when people worship the sun. It's like God is saying, hey, don't worship the sun, worship me. I don't even need the sun. I can make light without the sun. I did it for the first three days of my creation week. Land plants first, says the Bible. Sea life first, says evolution. By the way, in my book, page 68 and 69, I have whole lists of these things. So if you want some of these, I just pulled a few out. A birds on day five, says the Bible. Reptiles on day six. Oh, no, the reptiles came first and then the birds. Okay, I like to do this, so I think I can do this quickly. All right, your average reptile, your average bird, average reptile, dense bones, teeth, scales, cold-blooded, average reptile, average bird, hollow bones, beaks, feathers, warm-blooded. Okay, now this, over millions of years, became this. Is there any such thing in the fossil record of a partially dense-boned, tooth-beaked, feathery-scaly, lukewarm-blooded reptile bird? There's nothing. Now, some of you might have learned, oh, that must have been the Archaeopteryx. That's what I learned in college. No, 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 no. Archaeopteryx, now they have found bird, true bird fossils that predate Archaeopteryx. So they, it's now out of the picture. Now they're saying it was a bird. Man from dust, says the Bible. Man from the primates, says evolution. Man sinned the cause of death, says Romans 5, 12, 1 Corinthians 15. No, no, no. Death was present long before man came on the scene. Okay, if we believe the word of God, when did death begin? With Adam's sin, okay? Well, if death began with Adam's sin, can you have death before Adam? No, there was no death before Adam. You can't have millions of years of things living and dying, living and dying until you get up here to whatever it was and God said, okay, I'm going to call you Adam. No, you can't have it because death began with Adam. That takes care of evolution right there. If we believe what God says, that takes care of millions of years. We're going to come to that next week. All right, so millions of years of what? Death, bloodshed, suffering, disease brought man into existence. That's what evolution says. That's not what God says. Who do you believe? By the way, you can get these kind of little overhead things from Answers in Genesis, free of charge, all kinds of ones. Adam's sin came, by his sin came death. And by the way, that death affected everything. Plants, animals, humans, every single living thing on planet Earth ultimately dies, okay? The curse affected everything. Now, let's say there were millions of years of all these things going on. And here's Adam and Eve up there in the garden. Yeah, Eve, oh, Adam, this is such a perfect world. Yeah, very, very good, just like God said. And there's millions of years of death and decay underneath them. And as a matter of fact, thorns. When did thorns, thorns are said to be in the oldest sedimentary rocks. That's what the geologists tell me, thorns, oldest sedimentary rocks. When did thorns come up? As a result of the curse. So that's like 6,000 years ago. So they're in the oldest sedimentary rock. They did not exist until Adam sinned. That means they can't be more than 6,000 years old. Fascinating. If we believe the Bible. See, that's the question I'm asking. Do we believe the Bible? 
or the words of men. Evolution requires millions of years to progress from the Big Bang to molecules, to inorganic substances, to organic substances, to amino acids, to proteins, to life, to plants, to animals, and finally to humans. Yeah, that's what they believe. Now, examples of the battle. And my time is up. We will not have any examples of the battle tonight <laughs> because you all are getting ready to walk out on me. So I'd just like to say a little prayer. Is there one thing I should have said that I didn't that you three here can think of? No. Don't forget that crimson worm. It's Psalm 22, verse 6. Jesus, I am a worm. Okay. And you can tell people about that. And, and, people, and by the way, do we have some DVDs back there? I think we've got uh, a DVD I did with David Reeves on the crimson worm back there. We don't. Hmm? Oh, I didn't show him the dinosaur clip. Ha! Huh, that's what I was going to do tonight. Uh, well, um, I don't know. We have to quit. So I will do what I was going to do next week. I'll start with the seven-minute clip of finding the dinosaur with the soft tissue and the red blood cells. Okay, it didn't have time to fossilize. So we'll start there next week, if I don't forget. I had it all set up here. Everything's right. They had the sound ready to go, and then I forgot. I am going to pray and then get out as quick as I can. Thank you, Father, for taking good care of all of us. Thank you that we're back together again this week. And next week, I pray we'll be able to talk about the dinosaurs and Noah's Ark and some of these things that we have questions about. Are there good answers? And there are. And so I pray we'll get there and, and, uh, and everybody will have a good week and have opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, divine appointments. Let us all be looking for those this week, Father. And let some people come to know Jesus as their Savior this week because of this room full of your people. So protect everybody now as they're going back to where they live and bring us all back together next week. Uh, uh, in good shape, and then uh, help me to cover the things you want me to cover in these last two weeks we're going to have, and I pray, you know, I also pray, Father, if someone is here and they really don't know Jesus as their Savior, that they'll get that straightened out. Talk to Jeff or talk to one of the elders and just get it straightened out once and for all so we'll all be in heaven together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen.